Okay, like something uh, you noted, uh, we, we said that most of the code that you'll be writing when it comes to Android applications, they will be only be executed when a user performs a certain uh, a certain event. So in this case, if I'm assuming you already have uh, an application, a very simple application, which has one activity or has one interface with a text box and uh, a button. Okay, maybe you might want at some point now. I want to, and the user inputs a number in that uh, in that text box. Maybe has entered the radius. I can be able to when the user clicks on a button, they can be able to calculate maybe the area of a circle, or maybe they can be able to calculate the volume of a sphere. So that's where your code will be attached. Okay, that's when you realize that every time you add a new activity on your application, it will usually create two files. Okay, it will create a a layout file or an XML file and a Java file. Okay, so inside the Java file now is where you'll write the code related to that particular interface. Okay, yeah, and I want now to see how now uh, the key concepts that will help you now come up with that code so that when you see it in uh, maybe our future lesson, you'll not wonder what is, what, what is this because I think we have already come uh, across some code in uh, the concept that we have covered so far. For example, last week we were looking at maybe the life cycle, the life cycle of, uh, of, a comp of, uh, of an application. And you are able to look at something like, uh, something we call methods. Okay, yeah, and uh, those methods were using the concepts now of, of Java. And now when you come to object oriented, I'm going to look at just a few things, okay? But you'll find that there are three features which are common in all object-oriented language. And those are the features that I've displayed on the screen there. We have abstraction, polymorphism, and inheritance, okay? And you'll find that, for example, for abstraction, it's where you try to hide the details from the user. For example, let's say uh, I'm driving a car, okay? And I want maybe to slow it down. I just need to place on that on a brake pedal. Okay, so that means I don't even need to know how the braking system works for me to be able to stop a car. Okay, so that means I have hidden and all the details have been hidden from the user. The only thing that the user needs is how do I now interact with this system or how do I stop the car? Only by pressing the, the brake pendles and the car will stop or the car will slow down. Okay, so that's what we mean by abstraction now. You are hiding details. Okay, and in this case, for abstraction, in Java, it's implemented through something we call a class and an object. Okay, maybe you can mention uh, something about an object. So, what is an object? Okay, and an object is basically, for example, if you try to look around you, what do you see? You're going to see real world objects. Okay. For example, maybe you could see, maybe you have a dog, maybe you could see a dog, maybe you could see something like a bed, maybe you could see a bicycle. Okay, so those are objects. And uh, you'll find that each object, it will usually have two, um, two properties. One, it will have a state and a behavior. Okay, for example, if you are talking about a dog, a dog can have a state like, which breed is it? Okay. Yeah, maybe it could have uh, something like what? Maybe the color, what color is that dog? Is it white, is it brown, and what have you? Okay, the same case maybe with uh, with something like a bicycle. Okay, yeah. So a bicycle can have... Um, so like we've said also, a bicycle can have maybe the can have maybe the gears, can also have maybe the speed, no? or maybe it can have something you call the cadence, okay? Yeah, so those are states, okay? We also have behavior. For example, if we are talking of an object like um, a dog, okay? Maybe a dog can bark, okay? So barking now is a behavior, okay? Then, for example, uh, let's say it's for a bicycle. A bicycle can also have a behavior like maybe braking, can have braking or maybe spinning up. Okay, those are behaviors. Okay, and now in Java, uh, a state 
is usually implemented through something we call uh, fields or variables. Okay. Yeah. You'll be using variables now to, uh, to specify the state of an object. Okay. Then now for the behavior, we use something we call methods. Okay. So for example, I can have a method called breaking. Okay. And then I will now describe how do you break now. Okay. Yeah. So uh, then now uh, that's an object. But then you'll find that uh, one object, for example, a bicycle, we can have a particular type of a bicycle. Okay. We can have a particular type of a bicycle. Maybe you have a, a BMX a bicycle. Okay. So you can have different types of bicycles, but you'll find that now as you move from one bicycle to the other, one, diff one type of a bicycle to the other, there are some characteristics which remain constant. Or maybe if you, you move from one dog to another, there are some characteristics which uh, remain constant. That is, uh, for example, you'll find that all dogs must have a car. Okay, They must have a breed. Okay, Now, so you can see now a class is a template. Okay, there will be a template now and tell you now if, for example, if it's a dog, all the dogs must have these characteristics. Now, from that class, we can be able now to create different objects. Okay, we can be able to create now like a chihuahua or something. I don't know. So we can have different now objects. Okay, so you can see now a class is like a blueprint. Okay, it's like a blueprint of an object. Okay. Now, so now the the aspect of a class now, the class is able to wrap around the the behaviors and states of an object, and that's what we call an abstraction. So, anyone who wants to use that particular class, they don't need to know, for example, how a dog barks. Okay, you just want to. The only thing I'm interested in is to make the dog bark. Okay, so the only thing I'll be able to see from outside is the things that that particular class can do okay so you'll find that now the behaviors of the methods is the only way that the only way that the class now interacts with the outside world so for the for the states and anything else they might not matter a lot to me so those ones will they remain private to the class the only thing i need to know is the methods or what does that class do okay yeah and so now that's what forms abstraction and so you can see now uh, abstraction abstraction now leads to creation of what we call abstract uh, data types okay and now abstract data types is where you specify what type of data it can accept and the uh, operations that can be performed on that data. So you'll find that any time you create a class in Java, it's like you're creating a new data type. Okay, and that's what we are calling a, an abstract data type. There also came there. It's where also the uh, concept called encapsulation comes in. Okay, that aspect of wrapping around data and and methods together. Okay. Then we also have something else we call an interface. We have something called an interface in Java. Okay. And what an interface is, try to think of it, for, for example, uh, the TV. Okay. The TV will have the power button. It will have the power button to allow you to interact with the electrical system of that particular TV. So that means I don't need to know how the circuitry is performed inside there. What I need is to press a button, okay? And that's what the interface do, okay? The interface, they provide a way to link, okay? A way to, uh, a link to the, or to connect, to connect us to that particular class, okay? Yeah, so now that means every TV will have to implement it different uh, ways. Okay. So now, for example, for interfaces in Java, they'll only be in, they'll only have methods. Okay. They'll only have methods. They don't have a, they don't have a, 
a state. They will only have methods, and those methods don't will not have a body. So now the class will have to implement that particular interface and now give its own body. Okay, yeah. So we all have the power buttons in the various TVs, but now the circuitry is different from one TV to the other. Okay, so now in our case, we only specify how the method will interact with the outside world. Then for each class, it will be able now to implement it differently. So now the difference now between a class and an interface is the interface will only be composed of methods or it will only be having behaviors. Okay, yeah, and those methods will not have uh, will not have any body. Okay. But we'll be trying to look at what methods are in the course of the lesson. Okay. We'll, be, we'll be able to see, we'll be able to look at methods. Okay. Yeah. But uh, what I'm trying to say is now for the interfaces, it's just methods which don't have a body. Okay. They only have a heading or they only have a header. Okay. And then now each class can be able to implement the method the way they want now, okay? So for example, if I have a method like, uh, uh, maybe like for example, uh, set gear in a bicycle, I have a method like set gear. So I'll only have that method now, but we'll be having different ways for each bicycle now, it will be have, it will have its own way of setting the gear. But what I know is if, my, if a class has to implement my interface, it must, set its own ways or it will use only the methods that are specified in that particular interface okay yeah so it's a basic it's it's a simple way now of improving the class or or making it easier now for a class to perform the different things okay so now uh to implement to, to declare any interface just like we have said that for classes you use the class keyword to create a class for example, I can have a class dog. For the interface, we'll use the keyword interface dog, okay, to create an interface. And then now for a class to implement a certain interface, we only need to use the keyword implements. So we'll have maybe, for example, class dog implements. Uh, I don't know, maybe we could have another interface which you are calling a dog, a dog interface. Okay, so you could have class dog implements a dog interface. Uh, then uh, polymorphism. Polymorphism now, or maybe before you look at polymorphism, we, we can look at inheritance. Okay, inheritance is another object-oriented concept. Okay, and in this case, uh, uh, what inheritance does, it is it allows us it allows us to use to reuse some code. For example, uh, Let's think of uh, something general. Maybe like, uh, let's think of something like, uh, let's also talk of uh, maybe a, a bicycle. Uh, a bicycle, a bicycle, yes, is a, uh, Let's say a bicycle is a class in this case, okay? Yeah, but now we know that we could have different types of bikes. We could have maybe mountain bikes, we could have road bikes, okay? We could have tandem bikes and what have you, okay? But you'll find that all of those bikes, there are some, there are some characteristics they share, okay? But yet, we can also have some features which are different in those bikes. Okay, so for example, you can say that, for example, a tandem bike or a tandem bicycle has two seats and two sets of handlebars. I don't know whether you have seen uh, such kind of a bikes, but now for road bikes, they only have drop handlebars. For mountain bikes, they have an additional chain rig. Okay, so in this case, uh, for an OOP language, or for me, for example, Java, it can allow us to create one class that represents all bikes, then all other bikes can inherit that class. So in this case, it will be able to 
inherit all the characteristics that vices have, but then also have the capability to add the characteristics which are specific to that particular type of a bike. Okay, so you'll find that in Java, uh, just to be specific, uh, we can have a superclass and a subclass. A superclass in this case is the class that is being inherited. Okay, for example, we can say we have maybe like animals. Okay, we have animals. We can we can say animals is an object, but then we can go a bit specific and talk of uh, something like mammals. Okay. Yeah, so for animals, there are those characteristics that they have. Maybe they can reproduce and what have you. But now for mammals, we can have now more specific characteristics. So in this case, we can see that animal is a superclass of mammals. We can also say that a mammal is a subclass of an animal. Okay, so for Java, any or each super each each class can only have one superclass. Okay. In the same way, a superclass can have a potential unlimited number of subclasses. Okay, so I think that's the technical thing we need to understand about Java. And how how then do you how do you how do you now uh, do inherit for so to inherit um, to perform inheritance? We use a, a word we call uh, extends. Okay. Yeah, so for example, if we had a class called bicycle and we have a class called mountain bike. Okay, so to inherit, uh, to make the mountain bike inherit a bicycle, we just need to specify that class mountain bike extends, extends bicycle. Okay, yeah. And then you have polymorphism, and for polymorphism, it only allows. Uh, one object or uh, one particular object to behave differently depending on the conditions. Okay. Yeah. So, for example, you could create only one class for calculating the the area. I mean, we could have a uh, one method for calculating the area and call it area. Okay. But now, uh, what we are trying to say is, for example, if you want to calculate the area of area of um of a square area of a square you'll only need to you'll only need one parameter because the height and the i mean the length and the width are the same but now when you are calculating the area of a rectangle you'll need two parameters because the width and the length are different okay but since they are all performing the same thing we can call them we can give them the same name but now they'll be calculating the area differently depending on the number of parameters that the user has passed but we'll be trying to look at what we mean by parameters also in the course of the lesson. Okay, yeah. So that's polymorphism. So those are the three, the three uh, basic concepts of uh, OOP. And then now uh, something else I want us to look at in Java is uh, something we call a, a package. Okay, and a package is a namespace that organizes a set of related classes and interfaces okay so for example consider like uh, i have uh, 10 files in my project or i have 10 classes in my project all stored in different files okay yeah so now instead or maybe let's look maybe at a classic example of uh, Let's say you are developing a web application. Eh? So to understand what a package is, let's say you are developing a web application. Since you have already, I'm already, I'm quite sure you've already got some few concepts of uh, developing a web application. Okay. So let's say, for example, you have like 1,000 uh, 1, HTML files in your project. And then you also have uh, 10 CSS files and then you have thousands of images okay so the best idea would be instead of having all of them in one folder why don't we organize them so such that the images they go to the images folder the css files go to the css folder and now html files can go to the pages folder so in that case i've just grouped related 
objects have grouped related objects so even in java now you have that uh, you have that concept here you can be able now to group different objects which are related okay so now that grouping is what you are calling now a package is what you are calling a package and you'll find that uh, java comes with the um, comes with a, a lot of uh, packages comes with a, a set of packages for you actually that's one of the that's one of the most important features of the uh, java it has so many packages it has so many packages that you can you can uh, use for example let's uh, consider a package like uh, you have a, a package called system okay you find that that package called system it has so many different classes okay yeah and that you can be able to use for example if you are, maybe i want to or maybe let's talk of something like uh, the util or maybe we can also have a package called uh, lang okay but basically you already have an idea what what a package is so you'll find that anytime now i want to I want to utilize any of the packages that are in the library, in the Java library. We usually use the import keyword. Okay, you'll import that um, particular package in your project, and then you can be able to make use of any classes that were grouped into that particular package. And so those are uh, those are the basic now concepts, programming concepts when it comes to Java. So that means I've talked about an object, I've talked about a class, I've talked about inheritance, I've talked about interface, and I've also talked about a package. And so maybe before we, we even uh, move to the next uh, concept or to the next uh, slide maybe you could ask you a few questions Uh, of course you do need variables try to consider the following scenario this is a calculator eh? you're performing an addition you have two plus two three plus 21 okay so you'll find that your calculator you'll first input two right then you'll key you, you'll place on plus then you'll place two again okay so that means and then after now after that now you'll place the equal sign to get the the results so that means we will need this this first two we'll need to store it somewhere first then the second two we'll also have to store it somewhere first then also the result the calculator will have to store it somewhere first before it displays it to you as it waits for you to place on equals when it as it waits for you to place on equals so that now it can give you the the output so now we are going to look at variables in java now okay so now variables they are supposed to store data they are supposed to to store data such as uh, numbers and letters so in this case uh, in java i think we, we also mentioned fields fields are what we are what we also call now the variables okay and uh, when it comes to java you can have different you can have a number of you can have different types of variables okay so for example we can have a, a what we call instance variables 
okay you can have instance variables you can have class variables we can also have local variables you can also have parameters those are just different types of uh, variables that we can have okay but the basic concept we need to understand is those different variables it will depend the different types of variables that i've mentioned whether it's instance variables or class variables or maybe uh, the parameters it will depend on where those variables are are declared okay yeah and i think we'll be able to see that as as we move through the the slides okay so the data that we store in a variable we have said it's called now a value so to create a variable or a variable has two attribute it must have a name and a type okay yeah so now uh for naming for naming a, a variable there are some rules that we need to follow in java okay yeah and those rules usually apply across the board for naming it's only it's not the rules are not only applied to to variables but they are applied to any identifier or any name that you'll ever use whether it's a name of a class the name of an interface the name of a package the name of a, a variable and what have you okay and those rules are one it can contain only it can only contain three of these either letters numbers and underscore nothing else so you can't use special symbols like an hyphen a dollar sign a comma a full colon or anything okay yeah and then another rule is the first character must be a digit so the rest can be anything else okay but also though well, though like i've said uh, you should start your your variable with a letter it can also be started with an underscore okay, you can also start with an underscore but we, it's no longer encouraged we don't we don't encourage uh, starting the name of uh, your variable with an underscore okay so you prefer that you use you start it with uh, with a letter such as a b or a, a capital letter or anything then now subsequent characters can either be letters digits or underscores okay and also with the with the new with the, with the new improvement of java you can also include dollar signs okay you can also include dollar sign in your variable name okay yeah and those one can uh, the variable name can be of any length But one thing uh, we need to note now, like I, I said uh, earlier, if the name you choose consists of only one word, you should spell the word in lowercase letters, okay? All the letters should be lowercase. But if it consists of more than one word, then you'll capitalize the first letter of each subsequent word, okay? Hope we are together then. Okay. So if it has only one word, all the letters should be lowercase. If it has more than one word, all the subsequent words apart from the first word should start with a capital letter. Maybe it's also worth noting that in Java, as we are looking at the rules, all the all the names are case sensitive okay so the reason why we have settled for one convention is to avoid confusion okay and what i mean by case sensitive is a capital letter is treated differently from a lowercase letter okay so now to have uniformity so that you can be able to remember your variable names properly that's why you have said now you use that convention where if it's one word or lowercase if it's more than one word then the subsequent words start with i starts with a capital okay 
Then uh, another rule. If your variable is storing a constant, you might change that conventional uh, uh, different. Okay, if it contains a, a constant, we prefer you use all cases, upper cases. For example, let's say I was referring to a constant like uh, maybe the pi. Okay, yeah. So for pi, we don't use lower case. For pi now, we'll use all caps. Okay, so that's where the, now the, the convention changes. It only changes when you're using the constant. But if it's not a constant, now you can use the, what you're calling the lower, the lower camel case. But if, you're, if it's a constant, it should all be, it should be in caps. And then now, if it has more than one word, the word should be separated with underscores. For example, if I was talking about maybe number of gears, and maybe I've, I've called that constant num, I want to call that constant num gears. So I should have num underscore gears, all in uppercase. Hope we are together then. And then finally, there is a, there are some names which have some special meaning in Java, which have already which already have a predefined meaning. Okay, those names you usually call them keywords. Okay, so in that case now, uh, those keywords maybe will come across them. You will always come across them as you continue writing programs. Okay, uh, keywords such as void, static, public, private. So now you should not use those keywords to name your variables. You should not name your variables. You should not give them the same name as a keyword. I think uh, I've explained all of that, all of those rights. Then now we can talk about data types. Remember, you said that a variable will have two attributes a name and I mean the type and uh, the name, okay? So that one now will determine what data now is stored in that particular, in that particular variable. And so we can see that uh, the Java programming language and unlike other languages like uh, Python, okay? Java is statically typed. And what we mean by statically typed is all the variables must be declared before they can be used. All the variables must be declared before they can be used. And so this uh, now declaring involves stating the variable type and a, na and a name. Uh, stating the variable type and a name. For example, you could have something like this now. We have int number of rings. Okay, so that means you have declared a type and a name. Okay, you can also assign it a value by including an equal sign at the end there. Okay, yeah. So that one now will be variable declaration. So we have something we call uh, primitive data types. 
okay, or the symbol data types. You will find that in Java, we have seven primitive data types. And any primitive data type usually say that it's it's predefined by the language and is named by a reserved keyword. Okay, the seven primitive data types include we have a byte. Okay, and just like the word sounds, it's supposed to contain eight bits. Okay, so if you have a value that you want to represent using eight bits. That is, if your value is between negative 128 to positive 127, then you'll use the byte type. You can also have short. That's another primitive data type. Short is a 16-bit signed integer. Okay, 16-bit signed integer. That is, if your value is between negative 32,000 to positive 32,000. That is the value that you expect to, the value that you expect uh, to store in that value is between 32,000 and negative 32,000 and positive 32,000, then you can use short, okay? Remember, like I've said, short uses 16 bits, okay? And in programming or in binary, to know that how much you can represent if if the length if the length of the data type is specified in terms of bits if it's signed if it's assigned a data type you'll take two then power or raise it to the number of bits but you'll have to subtract one from those number of bits since you are considering it signed so in this case we could have if it's 16 bit, we could have two to power 15. Okay. If you can do that, if you have a calculator and you do two to power 15, you'll get 32,768. So that means that's the biggest number that you can represent using a short data type and the smallest will be that same value but now on the negative side so that so that means we'll have negative 32 768 and a maximum of 32767 okay the, the, the reason why i've removed one in the positive side is because we need also a way to represent to re, to store a zero okay but we don't have negative zero anyway okay yeah then another primitive data type that we can have is int okay and int it's used to store that two bit signed integer okay so that means in this case only the size has increased okay and to know how much a 32 bit number or the biggest number that a 32 uh, bit data type can store you take two then you raise it to 32 minus one which is 31 okay and you'll get the biggest number that you can store in that Then another data type that we have is long. Long, in this case, it has become a bit bigger. In this case, it will store, it will use 64 bits, but it's also an integer. So that means we have four integer types in Java. Then we have float. Okay, we have float. Float now, in this case, it can store decimal numbers or what you call floating point numbers, that numbers with decimal points. And float, is that two bit? We also have another floating point type we call double. In this case, double will be twice of float. So that means it will be 64 bit. Also, we have a data type we call Boolean. Okay. And in this case, Boolean only has two values, true and false. And finally, we have another data type we call char. Okay. 
Okay. For char, it's 16 bit and it's used to store Unicode characters. It's used to store Unicode characters such as A. Okay. Yeah. And what, what we mean by Unicode characters, they can be in different languages. Okay. It's a way to store characters. Remember that as you learned, when you're doing an introduction to computers or you are, when you're looking at numbering systems, you find that everything in a computer is treated as a number. Everything is a number in a computer. Okay. Even the letters, okay, for example, A, it's usually stored as a number. Okay. Yeah. Even, for example, an emoji, storing an emoji in a computer, we store it as a number. Okay. So now we have, there are some codes. There are some codes which have been assigned to each of those symbols or characters. Those codes are what we're calling Unicode. For example, A, we can use 32. Uh, I mean, you can use 64. I mean, actually it's 32. 32 is the Unicode value of letter A. Okay. So now anytime we want to store a character now, you use a char data type. Okay. And now with 16 bit, we have enough. That is the, the 16 bit that, that means you can have around 64,000, around 64,000 different, 64,000 different values. 64,000 different characters. I'm quite sure all the characters in the world can exhaust that. Okay, yeah, so that's why it was given a value of 16 bit. So now we have an organization which is supposed to decide if, uh, for example, for an emoji, which is which, which is its Unicode character or Unicode value. Okay, so that means if I declare a char data type, for example, let's say I've called char A and then it allocated a value of 64. When you try to output that value, it will give you A. Also, you can assign it using single quotes like A. But when it's stored, it is stored in as 64, not A. Hope we are together there. So those are the various data types you can use. So in the place where we have specified int, you can replace it with any of the seven uh, primitive data types that we have in Java. Also, um, okay. While we are still looking at variables, there is something else we call an array. There's something else we call an array. And an array is a container object that is now supposed to hold a fixed number of values of a single type. Okay. For example, I would want this variable that I have declared here, number of rings, to store 10 values. Okay. In that case, I will use an array. I will declare it as an array. I think I've already explained those slides. So like I've said, an array is usually an object. Eh? And uh, one thing you'll note that in Java, when you're creating objects, you usually use the new keyword. But I'm not going to look at that at the moment. Maybe you'll have a, you can always read on it more how you create uh, arrays. Okay, but basically you just use the new keyword because I'm quite sure at some point in your 
application, you might need to make use of an array. Actually, I'm quite sure you'll have to use or you'll have to make use of an array. But maybe I can demonstrate how you how you declare an array. And just create a method in my code. So that at least you have an idea how I just hope you can see my screen. So this is how we declare an array in Java. Okay, so we have int, then we have a, uh, some square brackets there. Then we have now the name of the array. Okay, so that's declaring an array. But now we need to allocate it some memory. Okay, by defining now exactly how many values now it will store. And for that, we use the new keyword allocate it memory okay so that's why you can see here we have the name of the array we have just created then we, we use the equal sign and start with a new keyword then the type and now we give it the number of values that it's supposed to store then we can be able to initialize the array as follows okay yeah you'll find that uh, the indexes in uh, java always start at zero Okay, not at one. So the first element will be at index zero and we can assign it this way. Okay, this is how you can now access the values of the individual now. So we have been able now to assign all our 10 values. You have been able to give it, uh, you have been able to give it now a value. Hope we are together on that. Then you have now uh, assignment. So assigning, we're giving values, uh, a value is what we call now assignment and we use a single equal sign, single equal sign operator to give any variable a value. So I think that one is not different from uh, from uh, what you have been doing uh, in other languages. But maybe something we can note is, is the types, okay? The types of the, or the result of the expression on the, on the right must be compatible with the variable type, okay? So for example, if my variable is of type integer, I can't assign a double here, okay? If I assign it a double, it will be truncated. That means, for example, if I had, I had a variable whose uh, I'm calling now, and then I, uh, I give it a value like 2.50, okay? By the end of the day, that uh, variable will be containing the value two. So that means then the decimal, the fractional part will be truncated, or it will be removed.
Okay, you can see now that's an assignment. For example, in this case, you're using an expression. Okay, and what an expression basically is, an expression is, uh, it's, a, it's like a computation. An expression is like a computation. You can be able to combine maybe variables, some operators and maybe some other values and what have you to come up with a new, to come up with a new value. So then we can look at uh, operators. We can also look at operators in in Java. So now, uh, since uh, you already know how now to to declare and initialize variables, okay, you might now probably want to know how how to do something with them. Okay, and now operators is the best place to start with, to, to be able to know what to do with those values. And one thing I want us to consider is that something we call the operator precedence. Okay, yeah, we, that is something we need to be aware of before we even learn about the different types of operators. Yeah, operator precedence. What I mean by operator precedence is the priority in which the operators are treated in the case where they are in an expression. Okay, where we have now an expression or we have a computation where we have more than one operator, we need to know which operator will be will be which operator will be executed first. Okay, and so now uh, I think uh, maybe back in high school we learned something called board mass. Okay, yeah, that board mass now is what is the same thing maybe you, you would try to associate with when you are referring to operator precedence, where maybe you could say that now the division is, will always be executed before multiplication. But now when you come to a language like Java, there are very, very huge uh, specification, specification of um, of operators, so body mass cannot apply in this case. Okay, but now if you go to the Java documentation website, you'll be able to see now which operators uh, have a higher president uh, have a higher precedence than the others. For example, we could have maybe uh, the increment operators, the increment, the decrement operators having the highest precedence, and you have the assignment operators having the lowest precedence. Okay, so you can be able now to, to check the different precedence of the operators from, from, the, from the Java documentation uh, site. Okay, I think I can give you that link. I can give you the link to the Java documentation. Where you can be able to now uh, read the concepts into details because I'm quite sure some of the concepts are passing you as I explained them. You might want to go back there and check some of these, uh, some of these uh, components that you're talking about. Yeah, so I have posted a link in the public chat section. Okay, so that actually, that's actually the link or that's actually the documentation that I'm referring to. That's why you can see some, sometimes I'm uh, explaining some things which are not on the slide that is, uh, displaying eh? i'm using that uh, documentation uh, from oracle okay so you can always check on it it's quite easy to go through and you can uh, you can easily learn it on your own that is in case maybe a certain concept uh, you didn't uh, get it correct so you can check now the operator presidents from there and now we can maybe start by looking at the assignment operator i think i've already talked about that the assignment operator is usually a single equal sign okay then the arithmetic operators now the arithmetic operators are the same ones that you have been using in basic mathematics okay where you have uh, five of them we have the plus minus multiplication division and modulus okay or the remainder 
okay maybe the only one that is usually not very popular in this list is the modulus okay and the mobile the, mo the modulus is supposed to return the integer uh, the division of an integer okay for example if we had two divided by three but, uh, it's probably uh, going to give you a zero if you try to do a uh, because i remember we talked about uh, the type uh, the types being compatible so if we try to divide the uh, two integers they'll give us an integer okay so if you have two divided by three it will give you a zero because in that case we are expecting zero point something where the fractional part will, will be truncated but what if we wanted to know now what will be the remainder now if it's giving us a zero what remained after the division will use the modulus operator there's a uh, one looking like the percentage symbol and maybe you can try to talk about that division operator okay yeah that's why you are saying that if both operators are integer the result will be an integer that is the fractional part will be truncated if you want it to be the the result to be if the two if uh, the if you want the result to be maybe a, a double or a floating point type then you'll have to convert you'll have to convert one of the one of the operands to a to a floating point value for example if i use 14.0 divide by 4 then the result will be a double well if i do the other way around like you have seen here the result will also be a double so there we have the modulus operator then parenthesis parenthesis usually increase the precedence they shall increase the precedence of of the operator so that means for example if i wrap around these uh, for example if there was no if there was no parenthesis here everybody knows that asterisks would be asterisk could be implemented before the plus sign Okay, but now if we if we use the parenthesis, we are increasing the the precedence of the addition uh, operator. So when you try to look at that precedence, when you go to the link that I have shared, you'll see them uh, organized into columns. Okay, where for example, you could have this is the first uh, row. So uh, as you go down there the presidents will be decreasing okay and uh, as you move from left to right so you also have the increment and decrement operators okay and uh, when you're talking about increment it can either be a postfix or a prefix this increment operator can either come before or after and they usually behave differently, especially when they are used in an expression. Then you have type casting. Okay, you can always include a type before a variable to convert it to convert it for example if distance was a if distance was a, a float and i want to convert it to an integer i just need to include the type remember the type must be enclosed by parenthesis We also have other operators we call unary operators okay so for unary operators just like the word south they are only supposed to take one operand okay for, exa for example i can have uh, the one for negating i think some of the unary operators that you have looked so far the increment and decrement but you can also have the unary minus okay or the one for negating okay you can also have a plus which which is taking only one operand and you can also have uh, i think i've talked about that we have a uh, increment decrement plus minus and 
and not. Then also we are still looking at operators. We also have operators that we call uh, equality, equality operators. Equality operators, okay. Then you'll use the dot operator. For example, you can have math.absolute, you can have math.round, you can have math.sqrt, you can have uh, math.py. Actually, math.py is uh, instead of a uh, space spelling by yourself, you can uh, get it from the math class. So these are some of the common. Uh, math functions and math class it also has two constants okay we have a e e for the natural logarithms and we also have the pi remember pi like we said remember we mentioned earlier that when you are naming constants constants are supposed to be in uppercase okay so even in math class if you want to access pi make sure that pi is in uppercase so you'll also try to look at those math class i'll be giving you some assignment at, uh, after this lesson that i want you to do i want you to create for me some different methods then now uh, uh, we can also look at the string class so now uh, we have the string class which is a class file that describes the data and methods associated with the uh, string objects and the string object is any combination of characters for example the ones you can see on the right side here these are string objects okay yeah so in uh, java i remember maybe if, uh, you have a background in c in c you are using uh, arrays to create strings where you could have an array of characters. But now, in Java, we have a, a string object where now you are supposed to create a, you have a string class where you can create ob, a, any object from that class. And how do I create that object? Maybe you can try to see, to look at it here. Okay, this is how now you, you create a string object. You start with the, the class name, then the name of the object, and then you give it a value. Then you give it a value. Then you can access now the, the, the various string methods using the dot operator, like we saw in math class. Okay, and you have a number of methods. For example, you can't assign, okay, or for example, you can't uh, combine two strings by by just uh, using a, a plus sign or you can't compare two strings by using the double equal signs okay that won't work so for you to compare two strings you'll have to use a method for you to to join for you to join two strings you'll also have to use a method okay for example you can see now we have we have created a a string object here called cd if you wanted to concatenate it you can use we can call the concat method but something you rem you are supposed to know is the string methods return a value but they don't assign they don't modify the object in this case yes you are trying to access the, this object you are calling str for concatenating but they won't modify it okay so it, it doesn't mean say since we had previously had cde when we run this method now, it will be CDXYZ. No, 
Neturoni return CD XYC and now you can decide what to do with it. So probably maybe you could need to perform a, an assignment to be able to achieve that. Okay. For example, you can have here string new string now is equals to the first string, you concatenate it with XYC so that now this one will return CD XYZ. So char only stores a single character and it should be enclosed in single quotes unlike a string the string should be enclosed in double quotes Now, depending on how many flaws you want, you can call the function 10 times without having to duplicate all those statements. So uh, we can define a method as a named group of statements. And we can have uh, two types of methods. We can have static methods and member methods. So the static methods, they are not uh, pinned to any class, but now member methods are associated with a specific class. For example, the math class okay, has useful static methods. Okay, So in this case, you don't need, for math class, you don't need to, to declare an object so that you can be able to use the, the methods in there. Okay, You can just access them directly from within any class you have in your, in your project or in your program. Okay. But now for member methods, they must be pinned. You must create an object. For example, the string. We looked at the string class. For all the methods in the string class now, those are member methods. Okay. For you to be able to use those methods, you have to create an object of that particular class. So in this case, we can try to focus on maybe static methods. Okay. Yeah. And this is a this is a general form of a static method. Okay. You start with them. Yeah. Uh, we start with the keyword like public static. Okay, for example, the public now determines uh, the accessibility of that particular method. How far can it be accessed? You can have it as private or even protected. Uh, then the static keyword remains. Then the, we have the return type and the name. And, and uh, finally, you have the parameters. Okay, so the return type in this case, when you are creating methods, when you call methods, they might return a value or not. Okay. For example, if I'm creating a method to calculate the volume of a sphere, I can decide that I want this method to return the volume that I have calculated to the one who is co who called it or to the caller. Okay. In that case here, if your method now is returning something to the caller, you'll have to specify the type here. You'll have to specify the type here. If it's not returning anything, then the return type will be void. Then you have the parameters. Okay, and then here you have the, the statements. You can try to explain those different components. So now, for example, the keyword public means anyone can access and use that method. The static means now it's not a it's not a member method or it's not coined to any class. Then now the return type specify the type of the value returned to the caller. If the method doesn't return a value, specify the type void. Then this is the name of the of the method. And in this case, for the name of the method, it will use the same rules that we specified for naming variables. The way you are naming variables is the same way you will name now your methods. Remember to always use a descriptive name. Then now this is the list of parameters that the method will receive from the caller. For example, if I specify two, two parameters here, that means 
anyone who tries to call that particular method will have to provide two values. Okay. So, and now the parameters, what they will do is they will be used to save the values that will be passed to that particular method. Then these are the statements that will be executed when the method is called. So we can have two different sections now in a, in a method, you can have the header here. And the header is like an interface. It's one which specifies now how it will interact with the outside world. This is the one that will determine how it will interact with the outside world. Then this is the, the body. So the, bed, uh, the outside world now doesn't need to be aware of how the body is. So this is an example of a method. Then this is how now you call the method by just mentioning its name. You can call the method as many times as possible. Okay? So you have the name and then you pass some parameters. So now uh, there is what you are calling control flow. For example, we have two methods here. Okay. So for example, the first method can call another method. Another method can call it. So now, for example, if I call day one here, if I call day one here, it will execute and complete, and then it will return the flow or the to run the program control to where it was called, such, such that now we can continue now to call in the second method. So in this case, the first method will be executed, then the second, and if there is any other statement below there, they'll be executed too. So the order of methods in a class does not matter. You can place your method anywhere. For example, when you try to look at the code that that maybe is usually auto-generated uh, for you in Visual Studio. Okay. So that that is me, for example, the onCreate method must come first or the other way around. Okay. You can place your methods anywhere you want. The order doesn't matter. Then a parameter is something, to, uh, something passed to a method by its caller. And a, a parameter, you can see it's a variable with a slight twist. What is the twist? The twist is that you cannot initialize a parameter and then for all the parameters, they must be accompanied by their types. For example, you have it like this one. You have our method here, public static void, say hello, string, name. Okay, so name now is a parameter. Okay, and the parameter must be uh, accompanied by its particular type. In this case, uh, this method doesn't have any parameter. Okay? So the parameters are exceptional if you're not expecting any anything from the caller. Multiple parameters, this is how you declare them, separated by comma. But each now parameter must be accompanied by its type. Then you have something we call overloading. Overloading is here now you can be able to use one name for two or more methods, okay? But now the parameters will have to be different, okay? Yeah, so you can have three, you can, I can have three methods in my class or in my program called area, but you'll find that maybe the first method has only, uh, for example, you can have, this is an example. All of these methods are called print average. Okay, all of them are called print average, but you can see now the first print average, it has two parameters. The second one has three parameters, and the third one has two parameters, but with different types, okay? So the different uh, parameters can differ in terms of number or type, okay? So in this case, we assume that if we supply, if the user supplies two integers, then the first method will be called. 
if the user supplies three integers, then the second method will be called. But if the user now supplies two floating point numbers, then the third method will be called. Okay. So you can always overload method in your class if you wish. Then the scope. Okay. So and the scope refers to the part of a program where a variable exists. And the scope is usually limited by these curly braces. So that means the, the variable will only exist within those two curly braces where it's declared. For example, if you consider this one, int x will be visible from this is where the curly brace is opening all the way to where it's closing here. Okay, so that variable will be uh, seen up to this point. But now for variable i, it will only be visible within here. As you, it's shown by these, uh, uh, many, it will only be visible within here. So the curly braces now are there, once with the limits, which limits the scope variable. So if, for example, if I try to call i here, there would be an error. So these are we pass parameters. For example, I have this method called the double. To call it, you can either give it the value or a variable. So in this case, when we do it this way, the value three in this case will be copied onto num. Okay, then I can now be able to use it the way I want there. The same case here, the value held in X will be copied to num. So that means it doesn't mean that these two should be the same, they can be different. So what we are doing here is what you are, we are doing what you call call by value. That is where the value is copied into the parameter variable. So if we modify the parameter inside here, it will not affect the original one that was passed. So now here you have a method that can return a value. So in this case, you're expecting it to return a double. So if your method is returning a value or the turn type is anything else other than void, then it must be have the return keyword. Okay, they must have the return keyword. If it's void, then it can't have the return keyword. So you can see now you're saying the turn statement now is used to return a value to the caller. So for example, here we have an example of a method that can calculate the volume of a sphere. Okay, and so that's all for today.